So my talk is fully convolutional networks for image segmentation. So before I start my talk, I just want to like get some brief overview of what people are, are familiar with. So can you guys raise hands for those logistic regression models? Okay, good. And maybe some of you know about uh, Gaussian models and Laplacian pyramids from computer vision. Okay, see, great, thank you. So let's go further. So I'll start with quick introduction of convolutional neural networks and my like small explanations and thought of how they work. Because for some, for a lot of people, it's just like a black box that just works. But I want to give you like a little bit of intuition why it works and maybe just show it a little bit more clear of how I think it works. So let's start with logistic regression that I talked previously about. So I see a lot of people are familiar with this, but for those who are not, uh, it's just a simple classification model, even though it's, it's a regress, logistic regression, is a kind of misnamer because it's actually a classification model. So here you can see this model was applied to classifying images. So on the, on the left, you can see the eight handwritten digit. Then we just take a, uh, each of these pixels and put it into this model and get final prediction. So this model has a little bit like, uh, has limitations. So for example, it can't repre represent uh, complicated functions and it's limited for like really, really simple models. But it's, it's fast, uh, but limited at the same time. So after that, uh, multi-layer linear perceptron appeared. So it's basically the same logistic regression, but it has a lot of them stacked on top of each other, and plus it has nonlinearities in between. So the main thing is that they add nonlinearities, and this makes the model really rich and uh, mistakes and the, the classification accuracy of this model is much higher than uh, the model that we looked previously at, like logistic regression. So, and I want to connect this model to models in computer vision. Uh, so let's go further and look at the Gaussian pyramid. So Gaussian pyramid is basically the same multi-layer perceptron, but you also apply convolution instead of just connecting densely to each of the input, input uh, features. And basically, you can look at the convolutional neural networks as a mixture of multi-layer perceptron, plus some ideas from computer vision world, like Gaussian pyramid. Uh, in this case, on the left, you, you can actually see the Gaussian pyramid. So let me give you a brief overview of Gaussian pyramid. So Gaussian pyramid is used when you want to apply your classifier on multiple scales. So for example, imagine you're searching for a face in an image, but faces can be on multiple scales. So like some person can stand really close to the image, some person can be like really, really far from the camera. In this case, you want to subsample and get multiple, uh, basically, representation on different scales of your image. And this way, you can find face which, faces which are really close to your camera right now and faces which are far at the same time. So if you connect this model to multi-layer perceptron and use convolutions, you'll get something uh, similar to convolutional neural networks, except it's a not ideal description of how it works, but this is just my thoughts. Also, if you look at Laplacian pyramid, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, thing from computer vision world. So it's just a basically a uh, representation of image with uh, basically where they take different frequencies from the image and they s basically make them independent from each other. So on the left, you can see the Laplace and Pyramid representation of the uh, Lena image. So it's basically uh, first thing you can see here is actually high frequency information of the image. And then if you go right more and more, you get lower frequency information. So in this case, it's a simple model, but uh, it's a little bit similar to how convolutional neural network works. So if you look at the image representation of convolutional neural networks, so for example, imagine you get an input as a picture of a cat, and then you try to put it through uh, convolutional neural networks. So on the, f on the first layer of convolutional neural network, you get some high frequency information. Of course, at the same time, it's also filtered. It's not all the high frequency information, but this is some high frequency information that will be useful for your final goal of, for example, image classification or segmentation. But if you look deeper in the network, you can see that uh, neurons there activate for some high level representations. Like you can see here that uh, one of the neurons activated uh, in the place where the head of the cat is located. Some other uh, activate in the places of ears, eyes, and maybe like paws of the cat. So you can see, look at the convolutional neural networks as a Laplacian uh, uh, pyramid of the image, but it's like also a little bit of a smarter version of Laplacian pyramid because you can also filter some things which will be useful for your final goal when you're doing uh, back propagation. So let's go further. So there is a paper, if you want to look deeper into the thing, uh, basically they showed in this paper that 
if you train, they train this network for uh, face recognition, and you can see that on the lower level of the network, they learn some lower level uh, features like edges, corners, blobs, and so on. Uh, if you go in the middle, you get some like intermediate representations like nose, eyes of the person. And on a really high level, you get like some more structured uh, high level information which the network uses to make the final decision. Just to give you a little bit of better understanding how a convolutional neural network works. So they use convolutional under the hood. And there are, in this convolutional arithmetic, they have basically that three main things. It's padding, stride, uh, and also padding, stride. Padding, stride, uh, yeah, basically that's just padding and stride, and, ker and yeah, yeah, and kernel size. So kernel size, you can see it here. So it's basically a region of the image that current neuron is looking at. Padding is just like amount of uh, like blank pixel we add on the on the corners of the image, and stride is basically uh, the step that we take in between all the convolution steps during our when we do convolution. So if you make the stride high enough, we can actually subsample input. So you can see here that input is big enough. Then we do stride of, uh, we, we apply convolution with stride two and we get subsampled input. So it basically connects all the picture all together. So if you looked at the Laplacian pyramid previously and my connection to convolutional neural networks, they subsample input gradually and then make decision going like to the high level representation. So let's look at the actual uh, talk for today. So today we're looking at dense prediction tasks. So dense prediction tasks, it can be like image segmentation or... So you can see here that is input as an image and you want to classify each pixel belonging to one of the class. So on this image, you can see it's a horse. So we want to classify each pixel that belongs to horse as a horse and each pixel that belongs to a human as a human. Another task also uh, consists of depth estimation from the monocular image. So you can see here that they regress the depth of the image. Uh, here they do uh, edge detection of the image. So all of these tasks are de dense prediction tasks. So they're a little bit more complicated because uh, convolutional neural networks, they have a lot of invariance built in. But in this, when we look at dense prediction tasks, we also have to uh, have a very, very good localization in our uh, final results. So this is the, highest, uh, the biggest problem in dense prediction tasks. So let's look in a little bit deeper into the, how it works. So if you look at any convolutional neural network, it just gets images and input and gives you one 1,000 dimensional vector as an output if it was trained on ImageNet competi competition. Uh, but fully convolutional neural network, you can look at it like, so if on the left you can see the cyclope, you can look at it as a, like uh, just image classification CNN, which gives you just one output given one Im image. But uh, fully convolutional neural networks, they give you like dense uh, represent, uh, output fr from your input. Uh, let's go further. So one of the problems that when you apply any convolutional neural networks to dense prediction tasks is fully connected layers. So fully connected layers, the problem, uh, so they face a problem for us because they have input as a fixed size, so you can't input any image. And this is just basically acts as a bottleneck for uh, the task that we want to solve. So we want to have, we want to input images of any sizes and get the output predictions of the same sizes. So it, let's try and to solve this task by casting the fully connected layers into one by one convolution. And basically this solves our problem, but not fully, because if you remember from the previous part, we do subsampling during our training. And this subsampling gives a bad thing is that we get predictions uh, that are downsampled by a factor of 32. So I'll, we'll tackle this problem a little bit later. Just let me show you one thing. So one of the interesting things, like if you take any convolutional neural network that was trained on ImageNet computation and uh, restructure this in the way that I described previously by casting fully, convolutional, fully connected layers and fully convolutional ones, uh, and then apply it to any image. So you can see it will be something like this. So you get an uh, image as a bus, and it actually somehow even outlines the part of the bus, even though it wasn't trained for image segmentation at all. So this network was trained only for image classification, and I applied it for dense prediction task without any training. So you can see this shows a really uh, good results. And if you train it specifically for image segmentation, it might give even better results. So let's do that. So one thing that we have to add here is that we'd have to apply upsampling. So we, we want the output of the same size as an input. So let's add upsampling. Uh, so you get something like this. So it's basically output of the same size as an input. 
again, this network wasn't trained for segmentation. So just a minor details, we also add loss. Loss is a cross entropy loss. It's basically the same loss that is used for image classification. You just sum, them, sum it over for each pixel. So it's basically the same image classification problem. You just do it for each pixel separately. So let's try to train it on one sample image of cats. We just train it on it and see how the network learns. So on the left, you can see the prediction of a network. And basically, this is ground truth on the right. So we train with this ground truth. And if you go further and further, you can see that network starts to see a little bit better. Again, it's just, just a simple example. Nobody trains on one image. I'm just showing uh, how the network learns so that I can show like on a couple of examples. But you can see from here that uh, prediction is a little bit coarse. So if you remember here, it's very, very highly localized prediction, but this is not what we want, actually. And to solve these problems, people came out with fusing layers. Can I have two minutes? So if you remember, features on different parts of the commercial network, neural network are uh, localized in a different way. So if you look at the features of the first layer of the network, it's basically edges and blobs. In the intermediate, is something in, in between. So we want to use features from the first layers of the network to better localize our predictions. So this is what we do. And if we train it on Pascal VOC, which is an image segmentation challenge, we get results, some results like this. So just one, one of my research problems, we basically applied it for segmentation of surgical tools. You can also do some fun, like create stickers out of images, then replace background, a lot of fun. You can do some, some things like iPhone uh, portrait mode here. You can see that everything is blurred out except the actual person there. So actually, we can also see it there. This one, no. Yeah, we also have like a small demo. One minute and I'm done. Okay, it's there. Yeah, you guys can see that it's me. I'm sorry, like it doesn't fit for some reason with this. So it basically gets uh, segmentation in real time. So you can see it's me speaking, just as an example of application of fully commercial network for segmentation of people. So you can apply it to any problem you have at hand. So that's basically it. OK, sorry. <laughs> Took a little bit more time. Thank you, guys. Other questions? You can ask me in the talk. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. Well, let me give one more. So we have implementations in PyTorch, in TensorFlow, and also in C++. So we just rewrote it like purely in C++. So just to give a little bit more common soul. But I think PyTorch is a little bit better for research. Like, I have to support that because I wrote this, the same thing in TensorFlow before and in PyTorch. Uh, they're just amount, the price you pay for debugging TensorFlow is just enormous. So PyTorch, I think, the debugging thing is very, very good. So in PyTorch, you can build a lot more complicated models. When I was working with TensorFlow, I was mo mostly thinking about how can I implement this. In PyTorch, I can focus more on research, actually. So just my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, guys, once again. <laughs>